Hey everybody, welcome to Should I Love with Jason Stewart and my guest, one of my oldest, dearest friends, legendary acting coach Ivana Chubbuck. And I gotta tell you guys, I met Ivana when I was 15 years You're old. Aging me. And <laughs> aging both of us <laughs> in an acting class, in an acting class of a guy named Lawrence Park who uh, tried really, really hard to help people, but was from such a different era of time. And uh, you actually did the funniest thing, which I talked about in my last um, podcast with you, is that you were, in the class, they did a lot of improvisations, and the door to the class was on the stage. And in the class, in the pro improvisation, you actually just walked out <laughs> mad. And we didn't really, and then you never came back. <laughs> so it wasn't the character that walked out, it was Ivana that walked out. I walked out because privately didn't know but this particular human being wasn't very nice to me and he was uh -huh. actually being very abusive verbally abusive and I grew up from such an abusive childhood from uh, physical and emotional and verbal abuse that it gets a point in your life where you just go I'm not taking this anymore and I'm, I'm gonna but which is real do it theatrically which too. is which is <laughs> right it. yes with, with it, was, it was waiting for me to return. and people kept going which well, is coming what was right but what's really <laughs> interesting about it though is that um, when you say that, because uh, we were just talking just right before we started, when I went to your class, I ha we had known each other through being actors, through being comedians, mm -hmm. uh, and then we knew each other uh, through Roy London when you were working with him as as his associate assistant, then associate, and then I was never his assistant. You were you weren't assistant. I created him as a teacher. What most people don't know is like he was just a guy sleeping on someone's couch. Uh, some of you both do, and. Uh, I asked my friend whose couch he was sleeping on if he would help coach me on something as a friend to friend, actor to actor, or something. I was so you knew him when he was just an actor? I knew when he was basically sleeping on someone's couch wow. as an actor. Um, and obviously, not making a lot of money as an actor because he was sleeping on someone's couch. But needless to say, my friend, I asked him, would you do like what actors do a lot is they help each other out? Uh, All the you, time. Yeah, would you coach me on this uh, audition for? Uh, for a universal uh, project. And he said, well, I would think it'd be better if Roy did this. He's never done this before, but he's got a good eye for things like that. He's helped me before, just as actor to actor. And so I did, and I and he was so good. And I said, Roy, would, would you like to be a teacher? And he said, yeah, just get a bunch of people together and I'll teach them. So it took me a bit, and I actually literally, and this is a true story, um, I was in a comedy improv class, and I had my friends, um, you know, come, really close friends to my comedy improv class, take the class, as well as anybody who was going to, I was single at the time, if you were going to date me, you also had to join that class. It was part of the deal. Even if they <laughs> weren't an actor? Well, chances are I probably knew you as an actor, <laughs> and that's who we hang out with, right? But if they weren't uh -huh. an actor, sure, they're comics, but the world we were hanging out exactly. with, so they wanted to learn how to so act. So you were with them from the beginning, because I didn't know you when I was... I was made I was in, I was in another. I was in another class, but, yeah. but I, our paths kept crossing and kept, kept crossing. But I think it's a really interesting story, because it's all about, to me, is about empowerment. He comes from an abusive background, too. We, we became good friends, as well, commonality of pain, about... Both of us needed to, to share the world of the arts through empowerment. It was because we both had similar um, realities growing up, um, abuse, and, and also as a gay man, he was a gay man, that he had a lot of oppression um, passed along to him just in life generally and was felt oppressed and repressed by the world at large. So together as a team, we created a class to help people change and grow and, and, and a system that ultimately, after he passed away, um, sadly, of, of AIDS, uh, is that I, I, I decided to take what we began and take it t 10 steps further to a place of like, you took it to your steps. own. You took it to your own place. It was just twelve steps. It, that didn't exist before, uh -huh. and it was all based on the reality of like, how can I have a very specific way that people can um, do script analysis, whether it's from the actor, writer, or director's point of view. It's simple. Put math to it. Put steps to it. I remember yeah, reading your because I remember reading your book. I have it here on my bookshelf somewhere. I can't see because I don't have my glasses on. But I remember reading, going, "God, this is so simplistic." Anybody can understand it, it, this. Exactly, but yet 
complicated because it's all based in human behavior. Tell Science people of, the name of the book. It's called The Power of the Actor. That's what I thought. And it's been translated into 20 languages and, uh, and still some more to come. But and, I got to tell you, what I really love was that little silver book that you, that you handed out in class well, way before. Yeah. I love that even, I shouldn't say this, but I, it doesn't exist anymore, but I and I still use it. Well, I have some private copies. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I use that quite a bit. And because of studying with Roy, uh, when I wanted to, when I was making the transition from getting off the road, I went to you. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to the class and sitting in the class because one would have to come to the class and watch. Mm -hmm. And then I remember getting irritated when they were talking uh, because I remember thinking, oh God, I'm not going to go to a beginner's class. I'm just not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm having this whole conversation in my head. And then I said, that you, at the end of the class, you let everybody ask questions. And I said, well, um, Ivana, uh, I probably wouldn't want to go into it. Jay and you just interrupted me and you said, Jason, you'll be in the master class, of course. <laughs> and then you said something right before we started that the thing that you did for me do you remember what I, you want to say? Because you were just going to say it a second ago. You gave me this uh, incredible amount of confidence, mm -hmm. and you treated me as a peer in the class, and it changed me. Because it was the first time I was in a class as an adult, mm -hmm. really feeling that uh, somebody was giving me my due for what I had, how much I, how hard I'd worked. And I think you do that for a lot of people, and you treat everybody differently in the class depending on what was going on with them. Well, I try to like explore the whatever growth that they need, not just as an actor, but as a human being. Because your acting problems are your your life problems. Generally, it's the same exact thing. It really is, and so, um, and the way I, I uh, purpose uh, objective, overall objective, and scene objective, is really an objective that will help you solve first the characters' issues on the page, and then, therefore, by personalizations actually uh, try uh, attempt to solve and often do solve the issues that are in your personal life. And so I do is I, I see with these people, um, what their issues are in life, because we explore it's very secret, private um, relationship, because the class is, is, nobody's allowed to watch, some journalists, and I've been asked for by the world at large if they can come, come in and But you shoot. also go up to people and you whisper in their ear. I do that, so it's really, really private. Right, so you don't say where it's up. But, the, but but let me finish. So the thing is, is that with with that privacy of people to be open and, and, and reveal their deepest, their darkest, to explore the things that give them shame generally, to actually explore it from a place of empowerment. This is the very things that you can do to take to your place of empowerment and solving to your objective. But I think so this I is really important. But I think this is really important. Though. I can't yeah. hate to interrupt you, and I'm dying to. Okay, but, okay. but but I can't because <laughs> it's what you said before that's so important and made me feel so safe in the class. Mm -hmm. Is that you came over and you whispered to people. You would know really really. Uh, um, personal things but you never mentioned the class there was no feeling of being abused mm -hmm. or um uh being treated badly in front of people and being or shamed power plays, or, or power, power plays, plays. that shamed. was one of the issues i had with that person i walked out on is because i said to play this game you know so the thing is that i that sometimes i feel like i have to take upon myself within my personal relationships say i'm being um emotionally um, uh, abused by a friend. Um, by You'd always bring up your personal things that are happening. You'd say, this is what's happening with me now regarding yeah. this, regarding my daughter, regarding this relationship, this is what happened with this. And you would say in class, this is how I was dealing with it. You would find a way to bring it back to the work. Well, I mean, how, how, the reason why I do that is because I talk about myself to give people permission to talk about themselves. If I'm asking someone to reveal some things that are very difficult for them to reveal to anyone, including themselves, I have to be the one that shows the bravery first. And I also have to like look at all the things that have happened to me currently, because you know, life happens, bad things happen. And you have to look at it as like, whether it's from the past or from the present, it's like there's always something to learn. There's always something to, to, to gain from it. There's always empowerment to say like, I'm a survivor and I can overcome and win in spite of and because of the very things that are, have happened, are happening, all of the all of the above i was talking to a, a friend of mine yesterday who is also a very very big time tv producer who's going through all kinds of like issues political issues that are really they're trying this is this business you know this business is very exactly active. and uh through a series of things that were not true um he is he was um 
let go. And uh, which happens all the time. All the time. And but then it, 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 in his getting uh, an attorney to like counter all these things, it turns out that there was absolutely not nothing there, and there was uh, actually someone like underneath that had like a bone to pick with this person and was able to um, do this. So what I, my conversation with him last night was, this is probably the best thing that ever happened to you. You're seeing it as like as grief and, and a problem and you might as well quit. So this is like giving you the ability to do something that you want to do more than the show that you're on. And so, and, and he said, well, indeed. So there's I've a been, sense of empowering to most of your students and to people that you work that you give them. And that's what you gave me. Yeah, is yeah. a great, great sense of empowerment. I mean, you've worked with some of the the biggest people in the business. I mean, I remember when I went in, the two big people that everybody was talking about, of course, was Halle Berry, mm -hmm. who won the Oscar for Monsters Ball mm -hmm. uh, a little after before I came into class, and Charlie Theron, who had won the Oscar for Monster. Mm -hmm. And I think your name was mentioned in one of the acceptance yeah. speeches. Mm -hmm. And do you think, uh, certainly those are the, the, you know, the dreams for people to be because uh, that kind of an award is not given to you from fans, which is lovely, mm -hmm. but it's given to you by your peers. So those are the people that you work with. And that's the hardest to get in the business is to get the, the people to... Uh, those are your peers, yeah. Th that are your peers, well, yeah. One of the things that I... Because I have schools all over the world now because this technique really is about taking pain, fears, and insecurities and finding a way to use that to overcome and win with as opposed to self-destruct with. So it's been useful in people all over the world. I have like actors that have become stars in their country that who barely did one or two lines in anything, uh, who are winning their Oscars, their um, Emmys, their Tonys, um, and, and places all over the world, basically using the, the, the idea that everybody can relate to pain. Everybody can relate to fear and insecurities. What people don't understand is how to utilize that to benefit your journey in life, as opposed to making it as a, 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 a point of defeat. It is really should be something that allows you to explore change, growth, and involvement, and uh, air force and personal you know, uh, prosperity. Uh, prosperity and, 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 and your own sense of accomplishments that you have, like literally, whether it's in the statue or in your heart or both. And then the, the work ethic oh, of some funny. of the people that you talked about, Charlie's work ethic quite a bit. I mm -hmm. remember about how she would come to class in between films and and, and, and just do it. I remember in Roy's class, Sharon Stone was like that. She, mm -hmm. she would come in and just work her butt off and she was somebody who was never afraid of looking bad. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I, uh, that was the hardest thing for me. That was, a, you know, it, it's just going, it's letting that go and just. Well, it is the hardest thing for most people to do. Um, I, I find that if you look at looking bad is also the only way you can look good is a way to think of life as you can't, like light and dark. I don't know the dark if I don't know the light. I can't know um, how to look good in front of other people or explore how other people perceive me as great if I don't understand my failings and how bad I'm capable of being. I, I, I think it's interesting to me, it's like when like this includes like Halle Berry and all these people that like have worked with before they'd leave to go off on location um, and they'd be crying or upset and having panic attacks. Right. So it's like, I can't the biggest, do this. The biggest, the most successful people who have been successful but, but, in other roles and... and but, but it's not even, they do this, great people. Right understand the other side of things and like the more you raise the bar the more you're capable of how far you can fall too but you have to understand both that's a good so, that's a good point yeah. and and so if i and at these people i always know they're going to do give a great performance when they leave with massive anxiety about what they're about to do they said they, they work harder the work ethic becomes even stronger and the idea is again understanding how much further I can grow and, 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 and accomplish in this role by understanding how big I can fall. You know, so failure, the understanding of failure is also going to be your understanding of success. And you can't have success unless you truly, without judgment, see failure as a bad thing. Failure is a good thing. Charlie Stern said about me in, in the actor's studio, she said, I learned more when I fell on my face 
and I fell on my face a lot. Uh huh. Exact words, verbatim, but she said. Easy for her to say. Well, because she, <laughs> she did. She fell on her face a lot. But look how she's one of the Well, that's because one. of that yeah. notion. She understood yeah. that notion, and the notion of like, um, failure isn't to be feel bad about yourself. Failure is knowledge. I read. Um, you hear that? Failure is knowledge. Yes, I know. I hear it. I hear it. I <laughs> it's hear a very it. important statement there. We read. We had a conversation uh, a couple weeks ago about uh, David Boreanaz. Mm -hmm. That you've been working with him, and you work with him on on uh, his new show, uh, Seal Team. Seal Team, and then before, before you that, worked with Bones. Uh, Bones, and then before that, Angel, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think I started with him on Bones. On Bones. Mm -hmm. But what's really interesting about he's become one of the most uh, successful television actors around also, in, in also, series. And Bones is one of the most um, popular American series all over the world. And they're copying it in different countries all over the world. It's one of the few American shows that almost every country has picked up as one that they want from America. How many shows do they have to pick from? And right. Bones, a every time I'm at any place in all the different workshops I do, I'll, I'll reference Bones. I said, You guys have Bones here? And I'll go, Yeah. You have bones here, so I can reference the, my, the work I've done on that show with them because there's a reason why everybody relates to it because we've never made it be about procedure. It's a procedural show. We made Which is it the hardest about, thing to do. Well, it's not that hard if you if you do. I think it is. Well, I think. Let, it, let, let me tell you why it's not that hard and how I, I perceive. It's people want relationships. They look to to it, whether, whether it's theater, movies, or television relationships are key, of key importance. And what I would say is that every episode, the plot of whatever the plot is of that procedure, of that case, is going to facilitate growth in the relationship between you and Emily Deschanel. And Emily was also, she, both of them would come to the house and work every weekend on every episode. And together as a team, we created, this episode is about this exploration of the growth of your relationship. So when you look at Lethal Weapon, for example, Lethal Weapon 1, 2, and 3, you remember their relationship. Do you remember the plots of those? Of no. Those? Not, not one, but you, you remember, remember their Danny relationship. Danny Barber, Mel Gibson, it was the, most, the first one was, was probably one of the, mo the most exciting and the first time I ever really fell in love with a buddy comedy, and everybody's been trying to copy that film since. Oh, like what they're trying to do is make it about plot. And they, they go back it's to not. their relationship. If it's about relationship, that's what people go. But you also have helped uh, David with dialogue, Ch making the dialogue more real, making it more. Was it more real, more, more, more competitive, more fun, more, more of like the idea of who's going to win this? Um, putting that kind of contest. I always believe that uh, human beings have a competitive nature. It's part. It's like before theater. Theater was born two thousand years ago. But uh, there's, there's proof that there's been games and sports played by even Neanderthal man. Before man was even upright, they played games. So we, our very primal nature is to want to win and play games. So put that into work because the people that we are most compelled by in terms of just our personal relationships are people that uh, inspire us to be able to play uh, the game with them. Like I love people that, that can throw it back at me as well as I can throw it. That's interesting because right? I remember doing a scene from Marty in class with you, and mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember this, and you said something that really surprised me. We did the scene, and you said, God, how did you, you said to the, you turned your back, and you said to the class, you, you said to the class, how did you play a heterosexual so, so real? Mm -hmm. And I said to you, well, that's me. That guy is me. Mm -hmm. And you said, oh, and this was probably around, I guess, close to 10 or 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And you said, oh, I didn't know that. And, you, and I thought, wow. You know, in the class, you, you saw that, that inside of that guy was who I was. It had nothing to do with being gay. Right, which is playing the scene. And the scene is for anybody who doesn't know Marty. But you were so, was, there was a will, Marty is a, is a, is is a, a very... Guy, very famous, but not everybody knows No. It. But the thing is, the bottom line is he's very uncomfortable in his own skin regarding relationships. And he doesn't think he's good enough. He thinks he's the, the loser in relationships. And that's so, it had nothing to do with being gay or straight. It had to do with the in, inherent reality that that's, you feel that you don't have that either. And it was beautiful. Yeah. And I remember crying. And, do you? Yeah, I remember crying and thinking, like, this is, that's why I asked that question. I asked that question because I thought, like, oh, you really touched me, but, the, you know, the, 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 I realized from what you had said, it's me. I'm like, I, I put a judgment call on, on a sexual predilection, which is, which is 
But you were you still are. willing. There was a willingness of you to turn to the class and you said, oh, yeah, well, I've learned something tonight. Exactly. And you said that I don't want to stop class. learning. This exactly. Is, this is really important. And that's what's really, that's what's really uh, was so fundamental about the class for me. Can I, can I tell you about what I also with David and, and Emily? To Please. The procedural. Please. Even during the times when they were interrogating, some of like a normal, like, like all the TV shows that are procedurals, there's always the interrogation scenes, uh, not one, but several. And I always made it, it had to be like, without changing lines, just had them compete whose interrogation was better. Oh, <laughs> who was better? Who, was, who, was better who got the answer. better question? Who got the better way of saying it? Who was more clever? Who got, who got the better response? And it was always that they were looking at each other going, oh, you won that one. Oh, I won this one. And so it's what it made... Again, about relationship, and which is about that, sex, and in, in, in a sense too, because well, about the sexuality yeah. between them, it makes it more interesting to watch because we love watching things about relationships. About relationships, exactly. And of course, there's an underbelly of sexuality and heart and soul and all of that. But the idea is, like, I don't compete with people unless I'm interested. I don't uh -huh. compete. I compete harder the more I respect you, the more I love you. And so the thing is, it creates a even love, more love dynamic that may not even be there between the two people that are playing those parts. You also brought Sylvester Stallone back from his uh, monosyllabic action films <laughs> when he did... <laughs> I don't say that. He did some good stuff like oh, yeah, he did. and stuff like that. He did. Yeah. He did some good stuff. Yeah. yeah. But he, he seemed to be... He reminded me of Burt Reynolds. Because both of them were incredibly charming, mm -hmm. funny, sexy, talented men, mm -hmm. but always chose to do what was easiest in their That's career. Right. He, he actually called me up and didn't have his people called. It's like I love, like Halle Berry, she just called me up you know, herself. Um, uh, Stallone did. I was like, really interesting. I'd answer the phone and I'd be like, hello, this is Sly. You know, we live like, oh my God. <laughs> Who's playing a thing on me? Is <laughs> yeah, this a joke? Like, this is a comedian. Like him, but like, <laughs> Sly who? <laughs> Sly Steinberg. You know, so, so anyway, so the, the, the really big people, they really are well, because it's Well, because it's also personal. This is not like, it's like, but it's so not like. So many people have their people call. I just, I, I just find like the bigger you are, the more humble and more connected you are to the people that you want to communicate with from uh -huh. from your artistic place. So anyway, he said, I feel like my my um my my art artistry has atrophied, his words atrophied. And I feel like you're the person that helped me explore you know change. This is for Creed, the first one that he was nominated exactly. for supporting actor for. Yeah, and also <laughs> the one he won awards that he had never won before. Like Tons. A People's Choice Award or Critics Choice Award. Um, uh, National Board of Review. I mean, just like he—it brought him back to where the character was. What, what he created in the first place, and and the, the, but we what we did was I said, look, you've already done Rocky. You are Rocky. You created Rocky. Let's let's explore what happened to Rocky after all the issues of his of his life happening, all the death that's happened, and and within the script, he he has a, a diagnosis of of cancer. Uh, but that he was going to die from and, and so what we used was um, so I try to explore empowerment through whatever your personal stuff is I try to use that in your work so you can solve it in your life as well as create an environment of other people who are watching go oh, maybe I could change my world too through watching this person's journey so his son had died three years before um, Sage and no parent ever gets over a, a child's death and so he, I said, let's let's use that as who this, you know, Creed's son is, and the idea that you never got a chance to say what you wanted to say to your son that passed, but this is where you're going to have the ability to do that. And he wasn't sure he wanted to kind of tackle that because it's scary territory. And so I said, just for the hell of it, let's pick any scene out of the script and literally sat next to me on my, you know, couch where I teach in my home. And we read a scene, and I just said, just see me as, as your son, and say to me, within the words on the page, what you wanted to tell your son before he died. And, and so he did, and I, he was crying, I was crying. He said, okay, I'm in. I'm in. And, and, he, and, and from an article, he, uh, in, in one of his quotes, he said in, in the New York Times, he said, it was scary, but ultimately it ended up being very comforting and cathartic. Comforting and cathartic. So people say that all the time, even in some of the worst movies. I mean, I was watching a documentary on Joan Rivers 
on E! the other day, it just happened to be on, and she said, when I did the movie about my life, about my husband committing suicide, it really helped me and my daughter's relationship. When I watched the movie, what I th saw was I went, oh my God, she's really a good actress. We never see her do stuff. But of course, the weirdness of playing yourself is so odd in a movie, but you could see, oh, so she was doing, I said, that's what I want to teach us. You know, and sometimes people do that. Sometimes you can do a role and you can do the work and it, you come out on the other side. Mm -hmm. Somebody else said recently, it's like, it's, it's like acting is like therapy. It's like being paid to do therapy. Well, one of my actors once said, uh, the way I teach acting is therapy without the cure. <laughs> uh -huh. So it's like, we're not in a therapy session. Sometimes when people go on and on in class about their lives, I say, look, this isn't therapy. We're not in group therapy here. We're using this to inform and explore the art on the page and therefore explore and, and uh, your own growth as a human being. And so, but we start getting caught up in the reality of kind of real careful of the therapy reality because it really is meant to inform art. And art is flawed by its very nature. Perfection and art are antithetical. And so the more neurotic, the more flawed, the more um, uh, the issues the characters uh, on the page are have, have the, the bigger of a mountain to climb to find the other side. And so that becomes dramatic. You know, it becomes exactly. a dramatic journey as opposed to like trying to find um, you know, there's, there's therapists for that. There's a, there's a, a whole group of people on the planet that went to school to, to understand how to explore that. My thing is to be able to empowerment through the arts. Very important statement of my empowerment by passing that along to my students, whether they're actors, writers, or directors. Actors, say it clear. Actors, writers, or directors. Yes. Because um, I think it really helps the writers. You know, Definitely helps because that's where that's that's where it all starts. That's the roots. That's the roots, and they have to tell the story. Of the actor, the writer, and the director tell the story together, and we have to have a unified vision. It's not having and one. The producer vision. gets it out there, yeah. And <laughs> hopefully, uh -oh. yeah. <laughs> and uh, and and so we have the um, obligation as artists within the um, environment of movies and TV that more people see that than go to church. And, uh, That's my office phone for everybody there. Okay. <laughs> that was another robo call. We hung up on them. Okay, so <laughs> it's a robo okay. call. Okay, good. Okay. Let's hang up on that themselves. Anyway, so um, the uh, the obligation of the of the artist is to pass along to their audience um, that if this person on the screen can take the same issues and pain and stuff that's happened to them and in uh, their lives and, and that I have in my life, then perhaps so can I. And so that your um, exploration as the writer, director, actor, mine as the, as the facilitator of, the, of that message, then allows the larger world, billions of people on this planet who, who watch TV and movies, are, are now allowed to be a part of the journey of empowerment through the arts. Well, I, I think for me, I have learned so much mm -hmm. from uh, watching films, going to the theater, watching television, things that I would never have even understood by reading because I'm dyslexic. Mm -hmm. And I, things are harder for me to, to comfort. I have to read it. And though I do love to read, and I read all the time. But uh, it, it gave me an understanding of different kinds of cultures, different way of being. I love seeing a movie that is completely not my point of view. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing Dances with Wolves, it's like almost 30 years ago. And I knew so little about Indians. And now this film would not be made in the, where the white guy saves the day. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it really changed how I thought about stuff in this country. I thought, oh, wow. Well, it's like, and that's, you know, that's the whole point is like that you, you and, and the, the most people actually have a TV set and they have the, and computers and, and ways to, um, to to communicate in the world um, to get information and in an entertaining way, not just in a way that so we'll like, listen. So we'll listen exactly. And you've I mean you you've created such a dynasty in a way. Your daughter now teaches with you. Yes, and you, amazing. And you've created such a dynasty in your uh, in your class. Uh, 
how do you think it's, it's such a hard question to ask because you probably don't have the exact answer but how do you think you become one of the most leading acting coaches in, in, in Los Angeles and in the world I would guess how do you think you did it? I mean, certainly being mentioned on the Academy Awards was a big deal. Certainly having people like Brad Pitt, Beyonce Knowles, Jake Gyllenhaal. I mean, you helped Elizabeth Shue, who's basically was just some cute, pretty girl and leaving Las Vegas. It completely changed her career for a number of years. Uh, so many, and now you're working with uh, Shia LaBeouf, who's trying to reconstruct his career in terms of uh, his image. But as an actor, my God, he's, he's amazing. An amazingly he's an wonderful amazing, actor. A true artist and someone who will, I, I can tell him to do anything and, and so many people would be fearful to do and he's just, he's willing to try that and then has ideas off the bat. It's like such a profound experience to, to work alongside this human being. He's a pretty amazing guy, an actor and force, force of nature for, for real. I mean, what he somebody doesn't want to give up no matter what was going on in his life, he never gave up his art. Well, he, and because he, he is pure, he is, it's a pure notion of art is who he is. And so he doesn't let other, you know, bullshit um, things that how the world says you're supposed to think or be allow him to change how he wants to, like, be perceived. Be per no, or he doesn't care about being perceived. How he, That's what I mean. How, he doesn't care about how he, doesn't care about his, yeah. how he actually is going to explore, you know, art. In ways that nobody even thought were possible, he wants to be a part of that journey, and so that's what makes working with him so like delightful and inspiring and all that. But you asked me a question about how did I get to that place, right? How huh? um, I find that if you really love what you do, and if you really love what you do, and just do it, you know, just be tenacious and with tunnel vision, just do it. I find that. The perk, I find the perk, the gravy is that success happens. I don't, some, I remember the first time I was able to not have to um, you know, to work out my checkbook because I said I had enough money bank account and I didn't have to think about that. Right. But it was like, because I was always doing that, I was to a T, like I'd have one penny left, so I have to be real careful on how, as I, you know, all the charges they have in the bank and da 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 da. And, and then it just, it, it occurs to me as things happen wait, I'm not in that place anymore. But it's not because I tried to be that's a kind of successful. It's because I loved, without distraction, that. To teach um, acting, to empower people through the arts, to be able to take their worst of circumstances and say, I can help you on your... Um, uh, uh, with your ability to be able to feel like a, a pros prosperous human being, not necessarily financially, but from your heart and from your spirit. Because I've lived through so much that I want to be able to take that information and, and help other people find their way too. And it happens by accident. So if I have I have uh, emails that I get all over the world that in my book that because I I put in the book a lot of the, my own issues and things that have happened to me, and how I use this craft to be able to change my own life, and then people have done classes for all over the world and I've been all over the world. No, I know because you cultures. actually teach in West Hollywood still three nights a week, right? I do. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, plus on and then on the weekends you go someplace. And teach some, somewhere else. Yeah, but the success happens because you love it and you want to work many hours because of it. Yeah. So and plus all your private people during the week, all the... Uh, I know, there's a lot. And, and there's yeah. phone calls now, and so I, got, I work with people all over the world, not just people coming to the house anymore. And it's not just famous actors, it's working actors like myself. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I don't really count them as famous actors versus working actors versus even like, you know, new actors because right. they... There's an open mind. I want a sponge in front of me. That's what I want. And if you're the kind of person, I don't care how big a star you are, if you're going to, if it's going to be a relationship of where I have to worship you, I don't want to have this relationship. No, of course. I don't expect you to worship me. I, in fact, I make people not do that. Um, and and I want to feel like there's an equal reality. I learn, you learn, I learn off of you, you learn off of me. We are together as a team exploring change, growth, and to the pinnacle of what we can do before we die. You know, and so if, no matter what that person's background, whether they have, you know, success or um, just, or just want to have it. a relationship with someone that's going to help them find, find their way, I, I'm in. 
I mean, you've taken a lot of people who, uh, I think people in the beginning, uh, Travis uh, uh, Himmel, Vimmel. Vimmel. Vimmel with the F. <laughs> the F. I never came. Ragnar Lothbrok, Vikings. <laughs> yes. I mean, you took Star some. Star Vikings. Yeah. Who, when I met him, was a Calvin Klein model who had done a series called Tarzan for one season. Mm -hmm. And people just didn't think he was going to go anywhere. And, he worked so hard. And, and he just, he did constantly, story. constantly. And I remember watching him change and seeing this guy that had no ego about the way he looked, though he was such a, a beautiful he was man. He gorgeous, but didn't, in fact, he really hated that that's what people saw first, because he's so Which I would love guy. if people said that. <laughs> right. That would be my fantasy. <laughs> I remember he did a film with Rebecca Miller. I, yeah. I can't remember but the name it, of it. What was uh, it called? Anyway, he was played a pickle salesman. And he was so completely, that was the first time I ever saw him in something that was who I had seen him in class, and it wasn't these, uh, you know. He, I, I want to tell people what the movie is. It was, it was just such a wonderful film, and he was so great in it. And I went to a screening of it, not knowing that he was in it, mm -hmm. and I was just so impressed. Maggie's plan. Maggie's plan. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So yeah, and that was the name of the girl, who's you know, who's the name of the main character. Well, the main thing is he's looking for for roles that aren't necessarily of size of starring role because he gets offered like the leading man, the good looks. Good right. The charm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he turns those down for parts that are like that that character that you liked him in. And Ma Maggie's plan. We played a pickle salesman that wore a hat. It looked like he was coming out of Utah, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Off the slopes, and uh, and then it was a real character. And he's been doing those kinds of roles. He did uh, uh, Lean on Pete with the original other playing a really screwed up, out of control father who loved his son very much, but it was just one like that was Andrew Haig, who is an incredible director. And was that who movie? did uh, 42, I think it was, or oh, Lean on Pete won so many awards. Yes, and and uh, he was. Uh, it's just like he's that's what he's doing now. He's doing all those kinds of roles. He's doing it right now a, a TV series for Ridley Scott. Not 4245. <laughs> that was the name of the movie, 45. 45. I don't remember that one. Charlotte Rampling movie. got an Oscar nomination for mm -hmm. it. was about this older couple, and it was one of, he also did in the gay community a film called Weekend, which was probably mm -hmm. one of my favorite movies of all time. I'm gonna check that out. This guy is so good. Yeah, yeah. He's and uh. He also did the series Looking, which was wonderful on HBO. And this mm -hmm. director is absolutely wonderful. I've probably rent, written to him around 10 times. <laughs> Never uh, hearing back from him, but I have written to him. And I'll, have with, it. I'll with ask hope. Travis to set you up. <laughs> well, not for that reason. I've written because I want, I want to work with him. No, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Okay. <laughs> Went down a different see, street I there. Some sweat. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, so that's you work with Meg Ryan, happened. too, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and Jim Carrey and Judith Light. And, oh, Judith Light, I mean, you actually uh, coached her with two back-to-back -back Tony Awards, and this is a woman who had done uh, soap opera and then a, a TV series uh, and uh, with Tony Danza, you know, who's the boss for years and had this image and this look. And this is when people who were over 40 didn't, especially women, didn't get a second chance. Yeah. And then she went on to do Wit. And I remember it because um, uh, it was, I went, oh, she shaved her head mm -hmm. to do the role. And she really, really did it. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's very, like, she's very courageous. And one of the things she tells me to tell, my students, she says, you have to work really hard. You have to work on everything. She, she, she I coach her in everything. And uh, she, she says, tell your people that there's no small part. Work on everything. This, it's uh, uh, break it down. Do your script analysis. Take chances. Push the envelope. Grow. Keep growing and working hard on your craft because things will happen. Because one of the things when I first met her was that she... And her words was a woman of age and a woman. And I bet uh, opportunities for, for women of age in this industry are, are rare and far and few between. And uh, I said, with blinders on, we're just going to do the work. I want you to focus on just uh, really accomplishing what your objective is with a point of view of having it like as a mission that you need to do this for the character, but more importantly, for your own personal journey of our personalizations. And she'd walk in this room, the rooms, and be like a force. So, Next thing I know, she's like getting offered everything. 
She's not only not getting a pilot, she's getting three pilot offers. She went to uh, France, it was Ugly Betty for just a week, her, and it was supposed to be just a couple of episodes to becoming one of the regulars. Transparent right. as well, by the way. So it was just supposed to be uh, a recurring. And they made it a. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and that's, I mean, she, she's been doing that off of the work that we've been doing, the hard work that she does. And then you just get, because she doesn't live here, she lives in New York. Um, if she can't be in my home, she tries to make it here whenever she can because it's always better when the person's face to face. But the so you do it on Skype or on FaceTime? Or? Well, do it's audio because I feel people on more of a cellular level. Oh, okay, there's something about looking at those screens at Skype or FaceTime that um, I find myself just looking at myself. <laughs> and then I'm like, I'm not coaching. I'm like, ooh, I look awful. And I'm not thinking about it. Anymore, you know? So I'm like, I'm just going to like cut that out because I know these people so well. You know how I dig it. Uh-huh. We dig deep together. You exactly. know me, I know you. And ways that nobody, including my husband and daughter and my family, know. They, I, we, I, we know each other's secrets and ways in that way. And so the thing is, I feel you. I, if I can feel you over a phone line, then I know it's going to visually be it very um provocative and amazing and so i do i do like that. skype though i have to say i do i do i wrote my whole book on skype with my writer okay. with my writer <laughs> i wrote the whole book but they're not skype. performing that's a whole different thing i guess so okay because if you're performing you have to get into the body of somebody and if you're looking at yourself how are you going to find you morph into and so this way of working, my way of working, you become the character. And so how do you do that when you're busy? They're busy looking at themselves because you can see both sides. I'm looking yeah. at myself. And the next thing I know is like, I said, what did I say to you? He's like, oh, I'm seeing a pimple I didn't know I had. You know? <laughs> <The> wrinkles. <laughs> Thought I took care of those. <laughs> so, 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 you know, it's like to me, if I can feel you through the phone line, it's going to be great for hmm. people to see the visuals. And it's been working for a long time. I've gotten a lot of people major awards, just phone phone call stuff. But it's it, it certainly it isn't about the awards. But it's but what the awards are just to say to people listening at home. I always think the awards are about getting the next job. To me, it's part of the the stepping stone to doing that because like acknowledging all the hard work you've done, and that's all the that's years nice. you put in. And, and said, so like, okay, it wasn't for naught that I lived so small for so long. And, and because, like, what people don't get, they, they have a tabloid reality. They think everybody was born to rich and fame. And, and it's not the way it is. So all those years where you struggled on your, your day job, the job that you hate, the um, living very small, living on top on, on ramen noodles, you know, and that's about it, and, and, and skipping meals because you, you want to pay for your acting class, which is what the case was with Brad Pitt and Charlize Theron. They have no money. They have no money. But they had to work all these, like, terrible jobs and, and live many many people but it was okay because ultimately you're doing it for the love of your craft so when you get those awards it becomes the kind of thing that says like it was worth all those years because it takes years it was worth all those years where i lived small because i was happily proudly uh, uh, working on my craft when i say to people you know oh i want this i want that i said well then you don't want to be an actor Mm-hmm. because our lives are not that you know our mm-hmm. lives are for me I always lived small and I always was careful about what I did and the most important thing was whether I was going to be able to you we have a money to take a plane and go meet some director if I had to that's, that's how I got sad. birth of an issue I just got on the plane and I just used yeah. a freaking flyer and some guy named you know Nate Parker wanted to meet me and I went and met him and that was it and if I didn't have the money to do that I wouldn't have gotten the part or be able to go to New York and audition for something or go someplace else or be able to go spend the money with acting classes or to spend the money to have someone coach me on a role because I felt that I needed that. I yeah. That's the whole thing. It has to be your priorities have to be um, pride in your craft, really loving the, the craft and, this, and the art form and loving it enough that you're willing to not have um, things um, that if you want a thing's life, life, this is not it. If you, if you want a comfortable life, it's not it. I, mean, I think it was, it was uh, Thoreau who said that once he got famous, he remembered thinking the time when he was uh, was was struggling was actually the time he remembers with fondness the most. Everybody's, yeah, a lot of people, he, he said that, but a lot of people have. Yeah, like um, that makes sense. You know. right? And if you don't have that struggle time, 
and, and there's, no, there's not a satisfaction in your success, but you also have to love it enough to know that there's a possibility that success may not happen, too. There's no guarantees that that will happen. What happens in a different way? It happens in being able to make a living, be able to have a career, well, you know, well, for a lot of people. Well, what I'm, what I'm saying is sometimes it's a path to what it is that you're supposed to be doing, like me being an acting teacher. I started off as an actor. I never would have thought in many years I'd love, as well, be an acting teacher and second of all love it as much as I do but I became an acting teacher because I came here as an actor I thought that's all I wanted to do but when again friends talk to each other they help each other you know actor friends always help each other out I found myself really liking that experience better and people would say they give their best performances when I give them my friendly notes and then ultimately started charging just a wee little bit uh, and then became a school, which is, you know, that um, then that started flourishing because I, then I realized I don't really want to be an actor at all. But I, I had God, never... It makes me want to go back to class. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you've seen it. You know how much I love it. Yes. People, it's a, they just they, they, they I'm like, yeah. the love that I have for it. But I would never have had that if I hadn't come to try to be an actor. So so the issue is, is follow your dreams. It may follow, take you to another path, but... It will be the path that you're meant to be on, but follow your dreams is the only way that you're going to find what you're supposed to be doing, whether it's the dream itself or the dream that's an offshoot of what it is that um, you thought was going to be your life's path. That's a very important notion, by the way, because a lot of people just set about, I either can't do it, this is not, I won't be able to, so I'm just not going to, or I'm not sure that's what I want to do, so I'm not going to explore it, or... Um, if, if something comes at you while you're in the midst of like trying to follow your dreams and it's not exactly your dream that you set, planned out. That's what's happening you, you for, me, away. for me, for me, that's exactly, my have always been there. I started as an actor, mm -hmm. veered off being a comedian, veered off writing and producing my own things and doing my podcast and all, the, and all these other things. But when I go and I sit down with myself, what do I want to do? I always say, I want to act. That's where I feel the best. Well, this is, this is, and that's where I go back to working. And then somebody says, things always, what are you worried, Jason? Something always happens. And I think if you do, if you put that out there, then things, if you build it, it will come. Uh, and it has been. Like you said, you were talking to me about that short. That oh, yeah. Doing, and that's just getting a lot of nice attention. And and that just like you're finding like parts of like playing a... You know, so, you know a, a bigoted uh, slave owner um, versus you know uh, you know the, the, some of the all the different varied characters. That well, just as I was telling you, there I have this, some immortal coming out, and I play. I have a six-minute scene, and I remember you talking about. Uh, he, he, you know, you said that's the best thing for an actor is to have rather than being in a million, million scenes to have that one great scene in a film. Mm -hmm. And they only gave me two pieces of information. One was that he had a low voice, and the mm -hmm. second is that he uh, was intimidating. And I thought, well, you know, when I started in your class, I probably couldn't have done that. And now that that's a part of who I am. And I used a lot of the things that we learned in class in that part of the preparation for that part. And uh, it was quite a success for me in my in myself. And now the film is going to be able to be up to for people to see. Yeah, it's just, which is wonderful. And yeah. it's all like this. Like you, you, is that had you not done all these, like, you know, Things that you're putting out there, and then certain things that happen that you know that 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 seem like at the time like they're devastation. That, that things that I can't get past this, or this is really oh, broken my so heart. Many. Those things, if they hadn't happened, would have put you in a place where you had to, um, you know, look at something that you would have never looked at because you were too busy doing the other thing, and. Uh, and then all this, this happens all the time to my actors. It's like they'll get fired off a, of, of a movie or a show or they'll, um, they didn't get the thing. They almost came close to it and they thought this was going to make or break their career. And it turned out that that very, the, the movie that they got fired off of, for example, um, the one particular person which will, will remain nameless but is a huge star, um, became a flop of a movie and would not have been able to do the movie that did make this person a huge award-winning star. But that's but they could have done it because it would have... It would I would say sit, sit with like, yourself. Please. Sit with yourself for a moment. Mm -hmm. Pause. Wait. And see what the right thing is and what really comes to your to your heart and what what, where, what you really want to do and why you want to do it. And 
I always say that the experience of being on the set, that's what I love, is the experience of being on the set and working with the people in that moment when everybody works together. That means every single person you can think of, from the uh, director, the writer, the producer, all the main people, to the acting coach who helped you, mm -hmm. to the gal who helped put your costume together, to the person who did your makeup, all the people that in that moment it all has to happen. Yeah. And that's and, and that's, that's, and that's, your, that's your joy. That's my joy, yes. And I, my joy is my classroom. <laughs> exactly. I'm on set, I look at my watch a lot. <laughs> and, and with that, and with that, I want to know as we wrap this up. Uh, people can go to ivanachubbuck dot com, and I always say it's. Uh, I always think that people think Ivana is two N's and Chubbuck is one B. It's the other way around. Other so way. what you think, it's a one N, two B's, IvanaChubbuck.com, and you can find out how to get a hold of her class and speak to her, her peeps and... Uh, the book, the book. And the book. <laughs> the power of the actor. The power of the actor. And if you were really special, you might, if you're in the class, you might get the other little book, which I love, the little silver book, <laughs> which I have right over here in my office. It's been such a joy to have you on the show and a joy to have you a friend. I, I love getting to know you more as we get older. I really do. I love that. Well, that's a good part about getting older. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love you. You know that. I love you too. <laughs> Until next time, take care, everybody.